Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. So we do this webinar every Thursday, 8 a.m. London time, and I would basically just jump into it because it's a busy day. Um, so the first thing I do is I just want to say, you know, we do have our ZP Academy, so there are a couple of free courses and we'll always keep those free on the ZP Academy for those interested in biosensor data or biosensors and the science of these electrochemical biosensors. We also have our webinar, so every um, Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, London time, we do this webinar to sort of, um, how do I say it? You know, we do this webinar because um, we want to answer questions and we want to give sort of value back and we appreciate um, the inquiries. And we do have collaborations, we do offer jobs, we do have our ZP Developers Own um, website and we do have workshops. Now the workshops have really ramped up um, of recent. Um, so in November, um, we have a workshop in San Diego. So um, we also have a workshop at the end of November in Horten in Norway. We also have a workshop um, in Coventry in December. And then a week later, we also have a workshop in Grenoble um, in France. So we definitely have um, plenty of workshops um, going on where you can get, you can meet us, get practical experience. Um, if you come to um, Coventry, you'll end up seeing the R&D facilities in the UK. And if you end up going to Norway, you will end up seeing the manufacturing and R&D facilities that we have there. So every week we try to answer questions. This one is a really long question. So we have these questions around about um, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, phosphorus and potassium. Um, there's lots of questions actually buried in within the question. So I'll sort of try and go through these um, fairly quickly. And then materials also for sensors. So one of them is about, so the first question is about nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. The next one's about what materials can I use for making electrodes? Which is interesting actually, because the first question has some ideas around using PCBs. Um, and actually then the materials for sensors is also um, relevant to the first question. And the last question is just detecting blood, uh, which we went into the lab and we just did quickly, just for a bit of fun um, this week. Um, so making an NPK sensor, how do you make it? And it, there's lots of ways of getting nitrate, phosphate, potassium sensors. We do have these, all these links are underneath the video. So I know that this is a slight repetition, but um, this is a nice video um, featuring one of our um, engineers, um, Solrun. And she literally shows you, you know, to, to make a, um, for example, a phosphorus sensor, take one of our hypervalue electrodes. The link to the hypervalue electrodes is here. Take our activation solution. The link to the activation solution is here. And that's also underneath um, this um, video and you can functionalize using a pipette the, this video is also on this um, activation um, URL Solrun says you know you pipette essentially the solution onto there and you allow it to dry and that's how you you know if you were trying to really kind of cut costs or do it yourself then you know you buy some electrodes of Zimmer and Peacock um, the hypervalue carbon electrodes, I've got a link here. You deposit um, the materials on um, essentially yourself and you let it cure. Of course, you know, it carries a risk that, you know, you are you and you are not us. And therefore, you know, all the tricks and tips that we maybe know, they are, you know, essentially lost. And but people do have success doing this. Um, but you're sort of, you know, when you when you go this route, um, you're on your own. But um, this is a route that people can follow. We um, we say if you want to do this yourself, then hypervalue carbon electrodes and um, one of our activation solutions, and these two links will take you there. And follow the video. I mean, the, you know, the video is pretty short, fairly self-explanatory, and this is how we would hand make them. By the way, we would do it robotically um, at volume, or we do do it robotically. Obviously, you can skip that. Um, that stage and here i've got a link to our phosphate sensor uh the sensors you know we have a nitrate sensor phosphate sensor and a potassium sensor um, and you can skip the whole activation stage and just buy them from us um, activated as is and obviously those are then being made you know um robotically um i'm a little bit cautious when people say to me i want to use a pcb a printed circuit board as a biosensor platform you know, you have, I have to be a little bit, um, I don't want to say concerned, but 
many people try to use PCBs. Some companies have pulled it off. They put a lot of effort in to doing it. And PCBs um, are in, they have a gold layer on them. That gold suggests some inertness, but actually that gold's not that um, hardened. And then underneath that gold can be a nickel um, or a copper um, layer. And the problem is if those come through, then you're going to get what's called a corrosion event, you know, and a corrosion current, and it will really mess up your, the signal that you want to be specific to the um, nitrate, phosphorus, and potassium will actually become a reflection of the, um, it'll become a reflection of what's going on underneath that gold, um, which is the corrosion. Um, now, the kind of samples that you can use with these NPK type sensors are, you know, you can have a sensor like this, and you can put, um, we like liquid samples in electrochemistry. Electrochemistry likes to work uh, in the liquid phase. So you can put a drop on that or you can put the sensor into a, you know, I, I don't want to say a crude, but into a beaker and they'll work well. As long as the um, sensing end um, is covered, as, as shown here, and you're not getting solutions up onto these electrical connections, then, you know, you can test these by pipetting solutions on there or dipping them in beakers. We don't need an awful lot of solution in order to make these kind of measurements. So for example, you know, when we're doing chili measurements, this sounds ridiculous, but when we do chili measurements, we have a very, I would almost, almost um, gelatinous sometimes um, type solution. You know, these are not true liquids. And, you know, we've also done um, things like phosphate measurement in soil. These are not liquids, these are sort of damp, powders you know um, so I'm trying to say here that um, the sample types can be um, liquid which is you know what electrochemists really like um, or it can be I just want to say good morning to Aftab or it can be things like chili blood soil you know things that are not necessarily either clean or, or, in, or entirely liquid either that's I was describing a soil as a sort of suspension of particles um, and depending on the soil humidity, um, different amounts of liquid in there. The questions sometimes that come in now are, you know, when it comes to drift and calibration or drift of these sensors, the data that we have for these sensors is on the website. So that's what we put into the public domain. If people want more details, then it generally means a project with us. And that's, you know, a different kind of engagement. So I can't really comment on for example, a phosphate sensor, what its drift will be like in an application that we haven't tested. Um, it's probably worth saying that many of our sensors are originally um, developed for actual medical applications. Um, and the reason I say that then is, you know, for example, potassium sensing. You know, you take a drop of blood, you it has potassium in it, you put it on the sensor, you get a reading, you dispose of the sensor. So that gives you a sense of the kind of workflow that the potassium sensor was originally developed for. Now the potassium sensor has the capability of running for longer because in fact, um, the ionophores are in a polymer layer on top of that sensor. But as of now, we haven't got long-term drift data. And in the end, I have to say people have to try it, especially if you're trying to do something like take a formulation, put it on your PCB. That means you have to test it and do all that kind of characterization or engage a company like Zimmer Peacock. What we are up to at Zimmer and Peacock is we do have an entire technology stack where sensor modules can click into electronics and these electronics can take something like 15 sensors at a time. Um, electronic modules can connect to electronic modules um, via Wi-Fi and electronic modules can connect to base stations and base stations as long as they're connected to um, a router or Wi-Fi can also send data to the cloud. So we do have this and this is what it um, looks like. Any links that you see jump up. Um, I have pasted them underneath the video. So these are what these sensor modules look like. They're trying to be a bit more robust um, than just the sensors because it's the electrical connections. When you put these kind of sensors into a tough environment, um, it's the ingression of liquid into electrical connections. That's the sort of weak point. So here's a sensor, here's some packaging. Um, here's one of the, um, either the base station or the electronics. Um, so we do have, um, these modules on. I just want to go up because we do have um, a link to that and we have a starter kit um, regarding that. Um, question two, this is a really tricky one. So question two is asking um, this. Um, selecting materials for sensors 
you know, it's a little bit, I think the question is, you know, um, is it only the surface area or do we have to consider the electro, um, the electro oxidation potential? Um, and the quick answer is you can't just use any materials to make an electrochemical biosensor. So earlier on, I was talking about PCBs. You can't just use PCB. PCBs, if it was copper, would probably be an, if the, if the exposed material was copper, it'd probably be an absolute disaster. Um, but if it's copper covered in gold, it sounds like, oh, it could work. But the only problem is then is um, th those gold layers are not really designed to be wetted. Um, you know, and actually the, the copper ends up corroding underneath the gold. Um, so let me just answer this question a little bit um, in detail now. And it says here, for example, can I have, you know, if my oxidation potential is 0.5 volts, you know, what does that mean in terms of my material selection? So in electrochemistry, we often use um, carbon electrodes. Um, we often use gold electrodes. Um, we often use um, platinum electrodes. So um, if you're making a continuous glucose monitor, then you're probably using glucose oxidase. Glucose oxidase produces hydrogen peroxide. You can't necessarily use hydrogen peroxide with a carbon electrode. Carbon is not that good at oxidizing hydrogen peroxide. So in that scenario, you have to use gold or platinum. So you can't, so it's not an easy question to say what materials you should use. Um, if it's an inorganic type molecule like um, hydrogen peroxide, um, I don't want to overstate this, but maybe something like nitrates, um, if you're trying to do the direct oxidation reduction of those, carbon's not often good. What is good is things like platinum and gold. Um, if it's an organic molecule that you're trying to detect, an organic molecule would be um, something like um, paracetamol or sorbic acid. Um, maybe that's stick with a paracetamol. The carbon electrode is good because that's an organic molecule and organic molecules can often be oxidized and reduced on carbon. So then you can start using carbon and you can also use gold and platinum. So there's no hard and fast rules necessarily on when to use carbon, gold or platinum. My absolute advice these days is keep away from gold and platinum. I make and sell gold, platinum and carbon electrodes. I do, you know, but actually platinum and gold is getting so expensive at the moment. You really should try and default onto carbon. Um, now, it's not you can't just use any metal. And so, for example, at Zimmer Picot, we do make a nickel electrode and we do make a copper electrode. But I, you know, we know when to use them, and I can't just recommend that you use a nickel electrode and a copper electrode. And I'll try and answer that through this redox potential um, here. So, at this end of this table, things like cobalt, nickel, and copper, these are the metals that are easily oxidized so you know cobalt can become um, cobalt 2 plus nickel becomes um, nickel 2 plus copper becomes copper 2 plus this propensity to oxidation means that if you use them on an electrode and you apply something like 0.5 volts versus reference and apply it then you're going to end up just oxidizing the metal and you'll have a you'll have a large signal but it's not specific to the analyte of interest. It's actually just due to the electrode essentially corroding underneath that positive voltage. The other end of this table, you've got things like gold and platinum, which are um, inert. And that's why we tend to use gold and platinum because they're inert um, and they resist oxidation. They're not perfect, by the way, but they do tend to resist oxidation. Carbon is actually one of the best materials um, for resisting oxidation, but carbon doesn't always work with all molecules that you're trying to detect. But I think as a rule of thumb, it is, in, you can't just use any metals or any surfaces when trying to do biosensing. And at one end of the spectrum, there's materials that you should mostly keep away from, which would be nickel and copper and, you know, cobalt. You you should most, we can use them at Zimmer Pico, but it's with experience and we know how to use them. If you're not sure, then, you know, really platinum, gold and carbon are your sort of default uh, materials. And if you do like, you know, have a copper electrode and you apply 0.5 volts. In fact, this will show it here. This is the cycle of voltammetry of um, copper. Um, if you try to apply 0.5 volts here versus this reference, you'll end up getting a large signal due to all the oxidation that's happening at these slightly lower voltages. So, no, you can't. It is important what materials you use. Um, 
I would recommend these days that people try to use um, carbon. But it's not a straight answer. There's no easy. The, the easy answer is um, your materials of your go to materials often in electrochemistry is carbon, platinum and gold. Um, and if I was trying to make an, a product, I'd actually be going towards carbon because everything else is um, getting really quite expensive um, these days. So that was question um, number two. I'm going a little bit quick today because after this, I'm going to shut my um, computer down and I'm going to hop on a train and just go into London. Um, lastly, um, and this is for some colleagues of AFCAB and, and mine um, in India, um, we do have a spectrum sensor. Um, spectrum sensing allows us to um, very quickly kind of put together, you know, minimal um, viable products or proof of principles. Um, and it actually allows us to do things like the detection of blood and get that data, for example, to the cloud. We can change form factor pretty quickly, but just really just for fun, and I knew because we could do it, um, this is my finger. Um, not that you can tell, but um, actually that is my finger. Um, this was taken this week, probably on Monday, and um, we squeezed a drop of blood out and we put it on the sensor just to sort of we knew this would work and you know we were able to get a very distinct um, signal for blood so um, it's no surprise to us that when we're, people ask us can you, can you detect blood yes we can and you know just for fun we did it um, this week so um, we had a question a couple of weeks ago you know can we detect blood yes we can detect blood and it's not that hard an application um, so questions right NPK so nitrate phosphate and potassium okay so you can one way of getting to a um, phosphate, for example, sensor is buy a hypervalue carbon electrode, buy the phosphate activation solution, follow the videos in the link, let it cure, and that's your start of your journey. You're sort of on your own with that. Um, the other way of doing it is to obviously just buy a phosphate sensor and some um, test solutions from us and get yourself going that way. Or the third way is actually um, work with us on it because um, these sensing... Um, is not that easy and it, you know it's I'm one of the team I've been doing this for 22 years it's not that easy um, second question very complicated question um, you can't it is important these the redox potentials are important when considering materials for electrochemical detection um, if you use materials like nickel and copper that have a propensity to form their um, cations um, and you apply 0.5 volts, you're just going to corrode those metals and just have a non-specific signal. And if you, um, your go-to material should be often carbon, gold and platinum. And I'm just saying economically these days, I'd actually go for carbon. And then question number three was somebody was asking us about the detection of blood. Um, electrochemistry and electrochemical techniques are a good method for detecting blood. And we just did a quick experiment this week, you know, pricked our fingers, put a drop of blood on there and got a very distinct um, signal for um, blood. So I know I've gone quite quickly today. Um, I want to say thank you to AFTAB for coming this morning. Um, and um, we will do a vlog and podcast on Sunday, 8 a.m. No need to watch that. But then we will do, um, we've already got questions coming in for next week's um, webinar. So every Thursday, 8 a.m. London time, we try to do these technical um, Q&As. Um, regarding biosensors. So thank you very much. Have a good um, rest of the week and speak to some of you next week.